your cabin Read those books in a blink Oh yeah Grab yourself a hot drink Cause you're watching how to train your Gavin Yep, that's me Hey guys, welcome back to How to Train Your Gavin I am doing my March wrap up today And I know what you're thinking, Gavin, it's nearly May This is a bit late, isn't it? Well, <laughs> a queen is never late Everyone else is simply early I was thinking, should I just combine March and April together And do this one big ranking thing but there's quite a lot of books so that would be even more intimidating. I was supposed to film this literally at the very start of April and I got all set up ready to do it and then I just couldn't do it so <laughs> I'm going to give it a second attempt today. I was just going to skip the March wrap up but then I thought you know what there's a lot of books to talk about in this one so it'll be a bit unfair not to talk about them so I'm going to try my best especially to remember a lot of these as well. My memory is not that great and I will fly through books and then a month later I kind of don't really know what the hell happened in it anymore but we're going to give it a whirl today and I did read 19 books in March and my average Copa rating for March was 8.33. That is my highest average rating for a month so far. I read a total of 6,548 pages. It definitely made me realise that I need to calm down with the reading. So April, I haven't read as much and I feel so much better for it, even though I've had more time. So I decided to only rank 17 of these, even though I've read 19, because two of them were rereads, A Pinch of Magic and A Sprinkle of Sorcery by Michelle Harrison. I reread these in March in anticipation of the middle grade monthly live show at the end of March, which was with Michelle Harrison talking about these books. And it was so fun. It was an amazing, amazing, amazing live show. Do check it out if you can. I'll link it somewhere up here. And oh my God, I had the best time rereading these are not included in my ranking because these are very recent rereads and I don't think I will in the future include rereads anyway. I literally only read this in December and I read this last year so they were still fresh in my mind and these would have come top of this ranking list anyway so I thought it would be a little bit unfair on all of the other books that I've read this month so I'm not including these in the ranking but these would be the top two of the month of course because these are two of my favourite middle grades of all time and I ended up listening to the audiobook of these as well as reading them physically and I absolutely love the audiobooks of these and I listen to it on script. If you would like a free month on script I have a sign up code in my description box. You can use that. Get your free month on script and I will also get a free month as well. Yay! I will tell you what the core pile I gave each of these books are but I won't do what I've always been doing and tell you what I gave each category in core pile. I think I might have upset a couple of people who might have watched my last one. Some people just maybe took a little bit too personally. So I'm not going to include my breakdown of the scores in the core pile, but I will give you my overall core pile. So for A Pinch of Magic, the core pile is 9.57, which is more than what I originally gave it when I read it last year. And A Sprinkle of Sorcery has 9.71, which is more than what I gave it in December. Yeah, these ones definitely got a boost from a reread and I still absolutely love them. But I won't talk about them too much because I've always talked about these. So I will get into my ranking then. <laughs> in at number 17 is The Cruel Prince by Holly Black with a Copa rating of 5.71. And I like this enough, but it wasn't one of those books where I genuinely thought I would love it. Like I kind of went into this not expecting to love it anyway. So this is the first book in the Folk of the Air series and this is a YA political intrigue kind of fantasy and I'm just not really that much of a political intrigue kind of reader so I'll probably dampened this rating for me as well as, as well as other things. I'll, I'll get into that. So this follows Jude who witnesses the murder of her parents along with her two sisters. They all witness it and they are dragged to the fairy world where they are forced to live and it's really hard for humans to live in the fairy world because you know they are treated like dirt and they go to the school there because why not Jude meets Carden who is the cruel prince and he is a huge bully and this uh... I did like Jude in this because like as a protagonist I thought she was she was actually rather decent she wasn't just letting the people bully her she wasn't just lying down and you know taking it she was kind of fighting back every now and then and I enjoyed that I really liked the fact that she would stand up for herself and she wasn't letting herself be a kind of doormat because yeah she has been dragged into this world that she has no clue of being a part of even though she does want to be a part of it it's really hard for her to be a part of it because everyone you know it's the fairy world and she's a human and yeah so it's 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 hard <laughs> it's, it's the bottom line there so I enjoyed her having her agency. Um, unfortunately I don't think I really connected with her anyway and I didn't connect with a lot of the characters and I think that was probably due to the writing style. I wasn't a big fan of 
the, and Ashley said this best, but it's like kind of like the list-like kind of descriptions of things. Like, in fact, there wasn't even that much description. There is this big world that we're supposed to explore. So, um, Holly Black, I don't think did a very good job at world building because I felt like I had to rely on my own imagination a lot of the time, which is fine for a lot of books, but I wasn't given enough in any kind of description what this world looks like or what the characters exactly look I mean some of them you do but a lot of the time we have to fill in the blanks and it's like a lot of work in this book because you know like as Ashley said this is very list like they, this person does this and this person does that and it was very off-putting because this is supposed to be a fantasy and I just don't think it described anything that well really so it really dampened my rating on this as well it just really lowered it so this is why it comes out bottom of my my March ranking but I did like this to a certain extent to the fact that I would still pick up the next book and the Queen of Nothing as well which is the third book. I will continue with the series mainly because I have to because I read this for the booktube SFF awards. The Wicked King is the one that's been nominated but I haven't read this one yet so I read this one so I can read the Wicked King for the booktube SFF awards. So I mean I'm glad I read it I'm really glad I read it and I can take that off my you know booktube hype list but yeah, it's just one that I don't think I personally connected with, but I can see why people enjoy it. In at number 16, and you guys are going to hate me for this, you guys voted for me to read this one in the TBR video for March, and that is Keeper of the Lost Cities by Shannon Messenger, and this came out a core pile of 7.00. So it was a big leap up from my bottom the, with The Cruel Prince. It's a big leap up. This isn't a bad book at all. I really did enjoy it a lot. I think maybe the hype got to me a little bit and I feel like I could also have connected with this more if I'd read it when I was a bit younger because this came out in 2012 and it, I can kind of feel the 2012-ness from it. You know, it feels a little bit dated and I will, con don't worry, like don't freak out. I will continue with the series because I did enjoy it enough to continue. So anyway, this follows a young girl called Sophie. She's 12. Yeah, yeah, she's 12. Yeah, 12. She can read people's thoughts and she lives with a very normal family and she never felt like she could fit in with that family. She always felt sort of a bit of an outsider. And we have this young boy called Fitz, who is a couple of years older than her, actually. He might be 14. And he kind of tells her about her abilities and that there's this other whole world that she belongs to. And she's like, oh, yes. I mean, that's why I don't fit in here. I need to go with you to this place and learn about my skills and my craft and all of that sort of stuff. I mean, if you're getting Harry Potter vibes from this, yeah, you're getting them for a reason. But I wouldn't say that the Harry Potter kind of feel of this puts me off from it. It doesn't at all. It's it's original enough to not be a total rip-off of Harry Potter. It, it do, I can feel it, mainly because like I love Harry Potter so much, I see Harry Potter and everything. I did find this to be a bit slow going to begin with, and it wasn't really until like the last maybe 100 pages it really started to kick off and it was getting a lot more interesting. So I think, and it's quite a chunky book as well, so it, for a lot of it, for the most of it, it dragged a little for me, and I was kind of like waiting for that moment where I thought, why do people love this so much? And then it did click on by the end, and of course, as I said, I will continue reading the series, but I just didn't say it most of from this one. But I have asked some people since, and they have said this is probably the worst book in the series. So, I mean, the fact that I still enjoyed this means that the rest of them I will definitely enjoy, I hope. But I mean, one of my biggest gripes with this, I guess, would be the fact that I wasn't a fan of the attention that was put on to Sophie being a 12-year-old. I felt quite uncomfortable with some of her descriptions and the way people would you know, pay attention to her in this way. So I'm not making any sense here, but she would be described as, you know, really beautiful. And I mean, she's 12 years old. I don't want to think about that. So she is like the chosen one kind of thing. And this is using that role. But I kind of didn't really see to begin with what was so special about Sophie, other than the fact that she was really beautiful. But I also don't want to think of my middle grade protagonist as being, um, quote unquote, the slender blonde among her chubby brunette family. I... Mm, like, I don't, like, I, I wasn't a fan of that, and, yeah, like, Slender Blonde, like, yeah, so I just wasn't a big fan of that, and I was a little bit uncomfortable with some of the attention that the older guys, I mean, I was not saying, like, too much older, like, they're about 40, maybe, paying attention to her, and, like, it's not, like, a big thing or anything, like, it's not even that big of an age gap, but I just kind of don't want that in a middle grade, you know what I mean? I don't want... She's 12. <laughs> Can it not just be about the, the fantastical parts of the story rather than her being a good looking 12 year old girl? So, I mean, I didn't enjoy that aspect of it, but I will continue reading the series and I did think it was still good 
around that. So another jump up and in at number 15 is Another Twist in the Tale by Catherine Bruton and this one has a core pile of eight on the dot. This is an art copy of it. It was supposed to come out in May but it's been pushed back to November. This is like an unofficial Oliver Twist sequel. So this follows Tilly who is Oliver Twist's twin sister. Oh that was almost a tongue twister. <laughs> right, wow. And when you know like Mr Bumble takes Oliver Twist to the orphanage because Tilly is a girl she isn't seen as desirable because it's the Victorian times and she's like left out in the cold and this kitchen maid finds her, takes her home with her, and this kitchen maid is very poor. She works for this really rich lady who kind of grooms young girls to be these beautiful butterflies for her. When Tilly's going up, this kitchen maid does not want Tilly to be one of those butterflies. So when Tilly kind of comes of age and she's really coming into her beauty, that's when the kitchen maid, who has become her like adoptive mother, sends her away just to like save her from that, but things go drastically wrong. Tilly finds herself on the streets with the awful Dodger, and things go from there and she becomes like this little thief and it, it's just a really good story and I think it really fits in well with it being in the same narrative as the Charles Dickens original. So it was really well written in that regard because I could feel the Dickensian kind of inspiration from it. So it definitely felt authentic. I absolutely loved seeing the original characters from Oliver Twist in this as well. So we had the Oddful Dodger, we had Oliver himself, we had Fagin and I think those are the only three characters. I mean, <laughs> to be fair, some of them died in, in Oliver Twist, so it's fine. I've not actually read Oliver Twist before, but I have seen the movie, of course, the musical. And I was going to do a whole, like, as long as he needs me kind of musical moment right now, but best I don't do that. But I loved this story in this. I loved where it went. It definitely leaves off on such a promising kind of future. And I can't wait for people to read this one when it comes out. It is genuinely so, so good. And at number 14, and Jade is going to kill me for this, but it's Spellslinger by Sebastian de Castell, and I gave this one a core pile of eight. And I still think that is actually a really good rating. And I think because I just read so much this month that it just seems low. But I mean, I wonder what Jade gave this for core pile. I just think she'll still slap me for not being in like the top five or something. Anyway, <laughs> I'm joking she wouldn't do that. So this follows Kellen who was born into this really magical family. They're very well known and they are, you know, really powerful mages. And Kellen hasn't come into his sort of magic yet and he has to pass some trials before he can become a full mage. Kellen is really good at being like a little con man, a little con artist kind of thing. So I enjoyed the whole sort of sleight of hand trickery kind of magical element to this. It was definitely different to what I've ever read before for the magical system. I thought that was really well done. And Sebastian de Castell's writing is really, really good. I felt myself really engrossed in the story. It definitely felt believable in this world, if you know what I mean. And I liked Kellen as main character. I did find him quite whiny a lot of the time, but also at the same time, he has a right to be whiny because I mean, his family is pretty much shit. I hate his sister. Uh, and his parents don't treat him that well. Uh, but anyway, sorry, no spoilers or anything. But, you know, things happen and Kellen's life is put into mortal danger and things like that. So the plot of this is very fast paced and it keeps going. And I absolutely loved... Is the squirrel's name Reaches? It's it's something like that. I don't know how to pronounce it. But I absolutely loved how sarcastic this squirrel was. It's just the banner in it. It kind of reminded me a little bit of Spencer and Embot in Skyward. It kind of reminded me a little bit of that in a way. But Reaches is, uh, it, honestly, it makes me laugh so, so much. And one of the main reasons why I really like the characters in this one. But it did keep me guessing the entire way through. I didn't know where this story was going to really go or anything. So I liked it enough that I'm definitely going to continue reading the series. It's really, really good. Yeah, it's like, as a YA fantasy, this is definitely one of the better ones I've read. But yeah, it just seems low on this list because I read so much this month. That's the only reason. It would have been so much higher if it had been in a different month. Just putting that out there. But yeah, it was really good. And that's probably all I can really say about it. In at number 13 is Will Omos and The Lost Day by Dominic Valente. This is the first book in the Starfell series. And this one also has a core pile of eight on the dot. I had three with an eight and I just ranked them in order of what I personally preferred, like enjoyed while I was reading. So this one is in at number 13. And this one follows Will Omos. She is the youngest in a long line of 
sister witches and she can find lost things but the most feared witch in all the land comes to Willow Moss and tells her that last Tuesday has gone missing and Willow needs to help her find it otherwise you know the whole world could collapse kind of thing. So Willow accompanies this witch on this adventure there are dragons and trolls and it's it's so wonderful it's so whimsical and when you read it you will definitely feel that whimsy just really radiating from the pages and it does have nice illustrations in this as well really beautiful beautiful spread edges. <laughs> I'm a sucker for a spread edge. But I also think this is kind of more a younger end kind of middle grade. So if you're not really a big fan of the younger portion of middle grade, then probably avoid this one because I don't think you will read this and think it's anything quite new. You might get some deja vu reading this. But I liked it enough that I, I gave it still quite a high rating because I really did enjoy the adventure aspect of it. And I thought it was really well written for the age group it's in as well. There's nothing too complex to figure out about this but there are some really nice messages and themes that are explored in this as middle grade always does no matter how you know where it falls on the middle grade spectrum whether it's really young middle grade or you know older middle grade there's always some kind of message and moral to learn from it and you will still get this in Starfell it's just so good and I'm definitely reading the next one. I really love, it's, this definitely feels like a palate cleanser. You know, when you're looking for a really good palate cleanser kind of book, this one would really work as a palate cleanser. So I would still give this a try, but if you don't really like younger end middle grade, then maybe avoid, but I still absolutely enjoyed my time reading this one. And at number 12 is Dragon Pill by Yoon Hart Lee. And I read this one because it's nominated in the Booktube SFF Awards, but I'm really glad I did read this one. I haven't read very many Rick Ryden presents books and this is such a good one. I cannot wait to read the Arrow Shaw books next month. Oh, I'm so excited. But this one was really good. This one explores Korean mythology. So we follow a 13 year old girl called Min and she lives with her mother and they have fox magic so they can use like this kind of charm and this sort of shape-shifting ability to kind of deceive people and make them say what they want them to say. It's like a projection kind of thing. And I really love that. I've never kind of seen anything like that in a book before. And it was just really interesting. Min's older brother is also working as part of these space forces. And one day somebody who works in the space forces comes to the house and tells them that her brother has just went AWOL and he's gone off looking for this mystical dragon pearl. So Min doesn't believe she's been told the whole story and she kind of really wants to find her brother because she loves him to bits. And she goes on this space adventure to find him on her own, by the way. So I really liked the fact that she had her own kind of agency in this and she was very active. She's a very active protagonist. I don't think she made the best decisions. I think she definitely went, you know, into things too quickly. She's definitely Gryffindor. And I watched The Little Mermaid yesterday and I was definitely kind of on King Triton's side for a lot of it. And that just proves how much of an adult I am now and it breaks my heart because I kind of felt the same with Min. You know, she made these rash decisions and I was just like, you need to grow up. <laughs> but also, yeah, she is still, you know, a child pretty much and obviously it helped the story but this is set in space I absolutely love the world that's built in this and the weaving in of the Korean mythology it's so good and it's so well written as well I cannot fault the writing whatsoever I think some parts of this dragged and it's probably why it's not higher up on the list but it, I'm so glad I read it it's a great mythology book for middle grade readers especially if they want to read something with Korean mythology in it because there's not a lot out there I don't, can't think of anything off the top of my head that explores Korean mythology but it is weaved in with like space technology and magic and it's, it's so good so I'm really glad I read this one and yeah, I think it'll do really well in the Butch of SFF Awards if I have anything to say about it. So in at number 11 is Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This one has a core power rating of 8.14. I've already read this one on my page and I will link Paige's channel in my description. And I liked this enough. I mean, obviously I did because, you know, it, it is still a really good rating for this book. Even though parts of me is kind of considering maybe lowering this. But I think what saved this one for me personally is that I read this physically and I listened to the audiobook at the same time and the audiobook was like literally one of the best audiobooks I've ever listened to and I think that's probably what propels this up because I think on its own it's not really that great and even with the audiobook and stuff I still didn't find myself fully invested so anyway this is told as a sort of like interview for this fictional band called The Six and they're being interviewed about their rise in you know to stardom and making this album called Aurora and then their downfall and it's all told in this you know script format and you know as they're being interviewed and things and I 
I really wish this wasn't written in that way. Like, I, I, I can't tell Taylor Jenkins Reid to not write it in that way. You know, that's the, where do I get off on that? Personally, for me, I just, because of the way this was written, I just could not connect at all with the characters because a lot of them came across as very false. And uh, like, what I mean by that is when they're being interviewed and things, a lot of characters are so redundant because they just kind of, they don't add anything to the conversation because it's literally maybe just a line and then it goes to somebody saying something with a bit more substance because a lot of these lines are just like a commentary on something or like just stating something like, oh, I didn't think that was right and then not elaborate on it kind of thing. Like this was a little bit of a while ago now, so I probably can't pick out anything specific to back that up. So I'm sorry, like this is a shit review, I know, sorry. But no matter how maybe well written the dialogue is, it just, it, was, it felt disjointed to me because it was a lot of cutting back and forth between people who I don't think are in the same room. So I just don't understand how that worked. And it just, it was just so dry cut and emotionless, I want to say. I just, because it was told in this way, it just felt so void of emotion. And we were building up to this whole thing about them breaking up as a band and stuff. And it just was very anticlimactic and I just didn't think it amounted to anything. So by the end of it, I was like, well, what was the point? You know, it was like, okay, right? We are reading about a band who are making the greatest album in the world. Well, we're being told this, but like, where's the proof? Like, this is all fictional. And you're talking to me that this is like one of the best bands in the world, or this is the best album. And they wrote this beautiful, beautiful song. And this was amazing and everybody loved it. But I'm like, but it's all false. And I just can't, like, I love fiction. And obviously I read fiction. So obviously where do I get off saying that? But it because it tries to be real, it comes off as false for me. And if I wanted, and I'm sure I tweeted this out, but if I wanted to read about the creation of an album, you know, I would probably watch a documentary about Little Mix <laughs> or One Direction or, you know, something. Some kind of like real album. But this isn't, this isn't a real album. So am I, why? I, and I, I know I'm just speaking this as like from me personally. And I know a lot of people do love this book and they love the songs and stuff in it. Because there is like some songs at the end, which, you know, great. And I listened to the audiobook. And, but I just like, would this have been actually like, I don't know, like, I, just, I don't know, I just didn't feel it. And of course, as I said to you, like, the 60s and 70s, and I don't think I truly felt that it was, mainly because of the whole dialogue thing. I just didn't feel it. And it didn't feel very rock and roll either. I mean, there was sex, there was drugs, but okay. And we didn't really get a whole load of that. We did get a surprise marriage, actually, I just remember. That was, that was weird. But also, I just didn't really like Daisy that much either. And I think if most of the characters weren't as pointless as they were, I might have enjoyed this more as well. But again, I've given it a high rating, but that's mainly because of the audiobook. Take the audiobook away, and this would have probably come like second bottom on this list. Okay, so going into my top 10 now, and I absolutely love this top 10 with my whole heart. And in at number 10 is The Strange World Travel Agency by L.D. Lipinski. This is the first book in a new series. There's gonna be another book coming out next year, but this book comes out on April 30th, so please, please do pick it up if you can. I will leave a link for you to buy it in the description box below. Ah, oh, I love this book. So we follow Flick who has just moved to this new town with her family and she isn't a big fan of having moved and she stumbles across this rundown travel agency that is being run by Jonathan and it's the Strange Worlds travel agency. She sees there are loads of suitcases on the wall and each of these suitcases are portals to a different world and there's like this whole multiverse thing that is just, oh, blows my mind. I love that. And Flick seems to be a bit more special, so Jonathan kind of takes her under his wing. And they go on these adventures. There are a couple of mysteries in this. So one of them is the fact that Jonathan's dad has gone missing. So there's this whole, you know, mystery about wh where he has gone. And also in the city of Five Lights, parts of the town is going missing as well. And there's something wrong and unstable with that world. That's kind of like a hub world for the Strange Worlds Travel Agency. And yeah, it's kind of like the mystery of like what's happening there. Is it connected with Jonathan's father, you know, things like that. It's really, really interesting and it kept me intrigued throughout the entire 
book and it makes me really really excited for the second book. I absolutely love the aspect of the world and how you step into a suitcase and you just you end up somewhere totally different and magical. There is like this jungle one at one point in this that felt very Peter Pan and I absolutely loved that and I really liked the dynamic with Flick and Jonathan as well. It felt very real. They don't always get on and I think that tension between them is very authentic and well done so it made me really root for the two of them. But yeah this is very high stakes as well so I love me a high stakes middle grade you will feel it and I cannot wait for the final copy to finally be dispatched from Waterstones like will it hurry up and come now I absolutely love the cover of it as well it's just so good ah oh, but it's it's fantastic seriously fantastic and it's a fantastic debut for LD Lipinski so definitely check it out and definitely worthy of the top 10 in number 9 is Jungle Drop by Abby Elphinstone and this one has a core pile of 8.21. This is the second book in the Unmapped Chronicles series and you don't really have to read Rumble Star, which is the first book, to read this one because it follows two different characters. The original character from the first book does cameo appear in this, so maybe you should read Rumble Star first. I would recommend reading Rumble Star first, but you can read this as a standalone if you wanted to. It's, I guess it's always just best to just go in series order anyway. So this does follow Twins, Fox and Fibber, and they are not nice characters. And what I love about this is that they are set up as really unlikable middle grade characters. They are very competitive with one another, but that's because of their parents. Their parents pit them against each other to help them with the family business. So they have this rivalry going on, but they're also just not generally nice people. They're quite rude. And one day they get whisked away to the unmapped kingdoms, which is, you know, in the sky. And in the first one, which I will talk about later because... I read the first one in March as well. In the first one, Casper Talk goes to Rumble Star, which is one part of the Unmapped Kingdoms. And in this one, they go to Jungle Drop, which is this gorgeous jungle setting. I absolutely love the setting. I love jungle settings in books. Really well done. Absolutely love that. But it just means that with the main characters being unlikable at the start, you really see their character grow. So even though the plot of this is very whimsical and this is just so imaginative, it really highlights what works so well in this book is having those characters and the development throughout it. It just felt very real and authentic. And it, it was great to say that. And I would definitely say that Elphinstone has this C.S. Lewis and Roald Dahl-esque kind of imagination, but she definitely has, like, I've read enough of her books now to know that she has made it her own imagination, her own staple kind of thing. Like, I can identify her style of writing as well as C.S. Lewis's and Roald Dahl's. It's similar, but it's her thing, and it really shines in it. You know, she just has so many wonderful, amazing words in this, and just a great imagination. It's hard for my imagination to keep up with her imagination, but it's so well written that you will, will keep up with it. But it's oh, just so well done. I absolutely love it. I was debating whether this was better than the first one or not, but I think they're both equally fantastic. But I think I might prefer, I do prefer the first one a bit. So obviously that's why this is in a number nine and Rumble Star is still to come. But yeah, I, I just really enjoyed this one. <laughs> and in number eight is Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief by Rick Riordan. And this one has a core pile of 8.29. And I can't believe I never read it before, but I did actually start reading it when I first got it. And this would have been, gosh, back in like 2010, 2009 maybe. And I still have the bookmark where I got up to when I first read it on page 57. And I didn't want to take it out when I reread it. I was like, that's, kind of, that's a memory. That is a memory. So I'm going to keep that in there. But I also listened to the audiobook of this as I was colouring in the Believe It On 2 map. So I had such a fun time reading this and listening to it audibly. So this is about Percy Jackson and he struggles at like this normal school. He feels different. And one day he gets taken to Camp Half-Blood because he finds out he is the son of a god. And he is a, a demigod. And he meets people there. And there's this mystery about who stole Seuss's lightning bolt. And he's kind of blamed for it. So he has to clear his name. He takes his friends along with him for the ride. And it's it's a great adventure story. I absolutely love it. I love the way it weaves Greek mythology in this one as well. And I absolutely love the whole, um because the fates appear in this, but it's quite subtle. It's just like mythology mixed in with the normal world. It's just done so seamlessly. So the fates can be just at the side of the road as three old ladies knitting or something. And it just, it works so well. And we also have like Medusa. And I just, I love the way it just it's integrated in this plot. It's just so good. I do kick myself on not having read it earlier because it, it's fantastic. I'm definitely going to read the rest of them. But also, I do still enjoy the film adaptation of this, which I ha I haven't seen in like a decade now. Like when it first came out in cinemas is when I, the last time I saw it. And I remember liking it. And parts of that film came back to me as I was reading this. So I thought it was a bit faithful, at least. I still need to rewatch it to really make that distinction. 
But I don't think the first movie's that bad. Sue me. I have heard a lot of crap about Sea of Monsters, so I haven't read Sea of Monsters yet, so I will make that distinction when I read it and then rewatch it. I will rewatch the films at some point. But yeah, I didn't think the film was that bad compared to this. I mean, it has Logan Lerman in, and back then I was absolutely obsessed, and kind of still am a little bit maybe. But yeah, this is fantastic, so. And the number seven is Small Spaces by Catherine Arden, and I gave this one 8.43. Yeah, this is a really spooky kind of middle grade, and I've definitely been feeling that these past couple of months. So this follows Ollie, who comes across this woman who's about to throw this book into the river. For some reason, she's going crazy about this book, and she wants to get rid of it. But Ollie takes this book from her and starts reading it at home, and it's about the smiling man, and it's really creepy. So it's a little bit of a, like a book within a book thing. So if you enjoy books within a book, you will love this and I really enjoyed the way that worked in this as well. We follow Ollie and her school friends going on a school trip to this farm but then on the way back the school bus breaks down, the teacher leaves to get help from this farm and the bus driver is a little bit creepy and he tells them that you've got to keep moving because they come at night or something like that, I don't know. But Ollie and her two friends, Brian and Coco? Yeah, Brian and Coco. It, it gets quite dark and twisty and I really enjoyed that. Like, I'm glad they left that bus because everyone else is boring. <laughs> I mean, not the best decision, I guess, but at the same time, if I was in their position, I don't know what I would do because it's still quite scary. But anyway, genuinely really, a really good read. Very atmospheric. Catherine Arden can definitely write. I really enjoyed that. The Smiling Man is very creepy as well. I felt a little bit deflated by the end of it though when the smiling man's kind of motivations and things come to fruition. Even though it's still really creepy and stuff I kind of like the mystery surrounding the smiling man and when you kind of learn more about the mystery it takes some of that intrigue away a bit but it's fine because you do learn more about like the scarecrows and things and behind that but it's kind of a little predictable because when I got to that part where everything's revealed I kind of thought well that makes sense you know I've, I've seen this done before just not in like a middle grade, but I've definitely seen this. I mean, maybe in a middle grade. I'm trying to think, maybe was it done in Goosebumps? I don't know. But it's just like, I don't think it's like as original as I would have wanted it to, because it's just not surprising in that regard. Still really good. I gave it a high rating because I thought it was written really well. Atmosphere was very good. And yeah, it was it was a good time. So in at number six is Rumble Star by Abby Elphinstone with an 8.57 in Copile. So I did mention Jungle Drop before. So this one follows Casper Tok and he goes into a grandfather clock and finds himself in the unmapped kingdom of Rumble Star, which is in the sky. And there he meets Utley, who is just utterly hilarious. I love her. And he has this sort of adventure. There is this evil harpy Moog who is trying to rule the unmapped kingdoms and it she's yeah, she's quite intimidating and it was really good. I mean, not much more I can add to this one because everything I loved about this was in Jungle Drop as well. Really fantastical writing, so imaginative, really great to follow that imagination through because it just felt so magical as you're reading it. And I think it's like the world building and the fact that we're introduced to this new world is why I prefer this over Jungle Drop maybe. And I just love Casper as well, he's just such a cinnamon roll and it's it's a fantastic ride. Not much more I can say about this one that I haven't already said about Jungle Drop so I'm gonna leave it there but yeah in at number six so it's, it's really high. I absolutely love Abby's writing. Just Perfect. And number five is Starside by Brandon Sanderson, the sequel to Skyward, and this one has a co pilot rating of 8.64. So it's definitely down from Skyward because I think that had a co pilot of 9.14. So it's definitely, you know, a bit of a step back. I didn't enjoy it as much as Skyward, but it was still brilliant because it's, you know, it's still highly rated. So this does still follow Spencer from the first book and she is, you know, becoming a pilot and she uh, wants to follow in her father's footsteps. But there's a whole mystery about her father and how he betrayed everyone and things like that. So we find out way, 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 way more in this one as well. This has a lot of answers for a lot of different stuff. I mean, not just about her father, but about, you know, the species of Krell and other different species that are in the universe. It's just, the world just expands so much in this one and that's probably why it's not as great for me because it may be a little bit too much for me at once but it was still amazing. I still absolutely love Spencer as a character and her relationship with Mbot. Mbot is still so funny and he has this like existential crisis in this one which is just it's so great. I absolutely love their dynamic. The flight battles and things were getting a little bit repetitive for me as well so I wasn't enjoying myself reading these that much. I much preferred the moments where we kind of learned more about the world and the more about different things that I don't really want to say to spoil but 
it, it, I definitely loved it more when the world was building rather than I just felt like the story was being slowed to a, nearly a grinding halt whenever there'd be like flight battles and stuff it just wasn't as intriguing anymore for me so I think that let it down for me a little bit as well but I mean that's just personal preference I think. I still cannot wait for the next book and Brandon Sanderson is just a great author I think. He just knows how to write really engrossing stories. I mean this is only my second one so far but it just it definitely makes me want to pick up all of his other works because it's just so good and I know his other works are like different as well and stuff but I just think he's just a really fantastic writer and I'm just I'm really enjoying the ride with this series so I'm, I'm really happy I, I managed to fit it in March because yeah, I just, I, I really enjoyed it. And then number four is The 13 Secrets by Michelle Harrison, which has a core pile of 8.79. This is the third and final book in the 13 Treasures series. So I was really sad that this was coming to an end. You don't know how underrated this series is. Like, genuinely, I mean, the first book won the Waterstones Children's Book Prize in 2009 or 2010. Uh, this one came out in 2011, so it's a little bit of an older one, but, like, you can, it, it's just still so brilliantly written, and I absolutely love the atmosphere and the tension in this one. We still follow Tanya from the first book and Red from the second book, and, like, how everything sort of connects in this book. They're living in Elveston Manor, and there are still, you know, fairies, and they're, like, grim-esque, and they're tricksters, and, you know, it's just, like, this whole world of these fairy tale like creatures but there's like also this like battle for good and evil there's like life and death and it's a lot of consequences from the first two books really comes to fruition in this one so what i love about like this middle grade series in particular is that you know consequences aren't forgotten about you know these characters do feel the repercussions of what they've done in the past books and especially with Red. Red really struggles in this book and I love her as a character. She was my absolute favourite in book two and same again in book three. Just I, I love that characterization and the yeah it just it was just so good. <laughs> there was definitely the sense of sadness and you could feel the finality in this book and just like with the prose and just how everything was coming to a head and I just didn't want it to end really and there is a prequel which I will definitely pick up as well but I just oh I, I'm really missing this like series already I absolutely love it. It's all three of the books were really highly rated for me so it's definitely one of my favourite middle grade series now and it's just, mm, it's just so good. Definitely pick this up if you enjoyed Pinch of Magic or Spring of the Sorcery. It's just so wonderful and amazing and definitely like darker end of middle grade as well. So if you like yourself a dark middle grade, then this will definitely scratch that itch for you. The whole series will. And I probably think book two is still my favourite, mainly because of the Hag Witch, but like just like other things as well. But like, I just love the entire series. So I, I, all of them are great and none of them let me down. So it's a winner. And in number three is Gargantus by Thomas Taylor and this one is a sequel to Malamanda. The core pile for this one comes out at 8.86. I absolutely loved reading this one. I think I read it in one sitting and it was such a great fast-paced middle grade. So it follows the same characters from Malamanda. We have Herbert Lemon who is the lost and finder at the Nautilus Hotel and Violet Palmer who is this girl who is looking for her parents and they met in the first book. And in this one there are storms ravaging Erion Sea and Erion Sea is like this little seaside town. You know it's very atmospheric. There's all this fisherman kind of folklore and legends and stuff going on so it's really captivating and really interesting and there is this legend about the Galcantis who is who lives in the sea and they think that something's been stolen from it and that's why there are all these storms and it feels like Eurion Sea is sliding into the sea so there's like this race against time and like you will really feel scared for Herbert there are so many different times where his life is genuinely in jeopardy kind of thing so I really enjoyed that as well honestly because it, the plot is so fast-paced if it goes by so quick it goes by so quick you see the community in this develop and there are lots of questions and answers in this one as well I'm so excited for the third one because there are this is like this big question that I want answered so hopefully book three answers that question because oh, mm. I just I love the way this went and I loved how it, it played out and I love Herbert's friendship with Violet. I think they are so great together. Their friendship is just oh, fantastic. And they will literally do anything for each other. And I just, I find that so wholesome. I definitely prefer this to Malamanda. I think the series is just going from strength to strength. This one comes out on May 7th. So please do 
pre-order or pick this up and yeah because it's just it's brilliant it is brilliant and definitely my I definitely love it more than Malamanda and I didn't think I would but I did. <laughs> In at number two is Saga Volume 1 by Brian K. Vaughan and Fiona Staples. Fiona Staples is the illustrator and I just read Volume 1 not this entire chunky compendium but this has a copyright rating of 9.00 on the dot. This follows Alana and Marco and they are like two different species in this huge sci-fi world where there are like wars between the species and they've come together and they've had a baby and the people on both sides of this war are pissed off at them for union and, and having sex apparently. So Alana and Marco go on the run uh, with this baby, this newborn baby, and it's very Oh, it's so it, it's so high stakes, it's so action packed. Absolutely love it. I don't read a lot of graphic novels, but I was instantly thrust into this world and I was captivated straight away. It is narrated by this newborn baby, but this newborn baby is, you know, older but looking back on everything. I think it was a really good take to the narrative. So I really enjoyed that. She says a lot of ominous shit. And I'm just like, oh my god, like I'm I'm terrified of what's gonna happen. Like I don't want anything bad to happen to the characters. But also, right, this isn't Compendium 1, so these are all the issues that are out so far. And I accidentally flicked to the very last page and I kind of saw what the big cliffhanger is at the end. I didn't mean to do that. I never do that. But I was looking for a page number, you know, to see how many pages this had. And I didn't realise that was what's going to happen. And now there's no more issues after this. But I have... I've read the first two volumes, but I only read volume one in March, so I'm only ranking volume one, but it's a genuine five star. I absolutely love it. Like, this could literally go anywhere. There's so many, like, parts of space in the world where you could just go, you could literally go anywhere, and I love that. There's so much potential with this and so much imagination, and just, it's a fantastic sci-fi graphic novel series that I'm kicking myself I didn't read earlier. Oh my god, why didn't I read this earlier? I mean, Pekka sent me this last year, so I should have read it earlier, but fantastic, like, literally... 9 out of 10. So that leaves my number one, which is Wild Spark by Vashti Hardy, and I gave this one a core pile of 9.07. Love this book so much. And it's so underrated as well. This won the Blue Peter Prize for Best Story, and still not enough people have read this one. So please, please, please pick this up. I love it with my whole heart. <laughs> this is set in Medlock, which is this really progressive city with a lot of inventions. It's very steampunkish, and they have surpassed human imagination with a lot of their creations, so they can sort of bring dead to life in these mechanical animals. It's, it's weird, but it works. So we follow Prue, who works on her family's farm, and years ago her older brother died. One day the stranger comes to the farm and asks about this brother because he was a great inventor but so was Prue but the stranger doesn't know about the the brother's death so Prue takes his place so she goes to Medlock and she's pretending to be her dead brother but she goes there hoping that she will be able to bring her dead brother back and it's a fantastic story it's so unlike anything I've ever read because this world just opens up in Medlock and it's so imaginative and so well written it just it's so fast-paced you never want to put it down so, it's just so well written and I absolutely love it with my whole heart uh, I can't really say too much about because there's some like conspiracy and things going on and I don't want to say too much about it but it's just so captivating and you will think wow this just like works so well and it's just so well done. Uh, so many great characters in this as well. I liked seeing Prue and her relationship with some new friends in Medlock and it just it didn't go in exactly in the way I, I thought it would go and it was just brilliant and I love it when a middle grade really delves into some really hard-hitting themes so like death is explored and all that it's just so I love it when it does that it's very captivating and just it's done so well in this and it does make you feel a bit emotional and uh, it, this is definitely my favourite book of March that's not you know a pinch of magic or sprinkle of sorcery but this will make you fall in love with Fashti Hardy like straight away <laughs> need more Fashti Hardy books this is just so well done so great ah uh, and just fantastic and it, I think just on premise alone it should make you want to pick it up it's just so good Oh my god, there's so many of them. I genuinely don't think I can pick, and pick this whole thing up. It's gonna go wrong. It is gonna go wrong. Oh, oh, and I'm not that strong. But I'm strong enough. Oh no, I can't. Okay, I think I got it. It's definitely gonna fall. Okay, so this is all of them. <laughs> I'll put them down. That's all the books I read in March. <sighs> so no wonder I didn't want to film this wrap up because that's a bloody lot. I'm dreading to see what the raw footage of this is like. Thank you so much for watching my March wrap up, even though it was late, but technically it wasn't because I am a queen. But if you did end up watching this, then thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Please leave this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.